Welcome back. Today we are going to be talking about Italian immigration to New York City, and we're going to start way back in the 16th century with a man named Giovanni Verrazzano. That name may sound familiar to many of you, and it should. Uh, the Verrazzano Bridge is named after this Italian explorer who arrived in what would become New York City in 1524. He was just passing through, though. He was the first European explorer to explore what would become the United States' Atlantic coast. The first Italians who ever made New York City their home, actually who made the United States more generally their home, arrived in New Amsterdam in 1635. They came to what was then the New Netherlands, with its capital, of course, being New Amsterdam, uh, because there was a, a religious tolerance that didn't exist elsewhere. This is similar to other immigrant groups like the Jews who arrived two decades later in 1654. The Italian population in the United States and in New York specifically continued to grow with many Italian Americans participating in the Revolutionary War and then later the Civil War on the side of the North. By 1870, there was about 25,000 Italians in the United States, but these Italians were often coming from Northern Italy, which was far more integrated into the rest of Europe, far more accepted by other European populations versus the later group that we're gonna spend most of today on, Southern Italians, who immigrated after Italian unification in 1861. So Italy wasn't even a country until 1861, and it was really broken up into a bunch of different sections with different cultures, different contact with Europe, and in the South, where the majority of Italians who immigrated to the United States eventually would be coming from, they were much poorer than their northern neighbors. And so while a large percentage of the population that had immigrated to the United States before unification was from the North, the wave that came after unification was from the South, and in the South, previous to unification, it was ruled by kings, and there was a large peasantry, and these people suffered economically and socially, and after unification, uh, Southern Italy was ruled by Northern Italians for the most part. Southerners were heavily taxed. There was massive poverty. Starvation was rampant in this part of the country, and poverty was the main reason that people came. They wanted to earn some money in the United States, and for the most part, return back to Italy. Many of the first wave of Southern Italian immigrants went to New Orleans. Slavery had just ended in 1865 at the end of the Civil War, and in the South they needed new labor sources, right? And so you have these Southern Italians who go to the South, and they often worked on, on sugar plantations, which is backbreaking work. Um, but they were making much better money than they could in Italy. But New Orleans was not so welcoming of Italians, and as would be the case going forward. There were certain stereotypes that perpetuated New Orleans society about what these Italians represented, and they were considered hot-tempered, and whenever there was violence between Italian communities, it was called a vendetta. Uh, the press, as they often do, built this up, um, and Italians became classified as criminal, as is often the case for newly arrived immigrants. They were met with great suspicion by local authorities. When a popular police chief was killed, uh, a popular police chief who had been known for being tough on Italian crime, the Italian community was immediately blamed. Uh, the cops came down extremely hard on this community with a massive sweep arresting 200 people. 19 Italian immigrants would be tried for murder. They were accused of being a mafia. Uh, this is the first time this word comes into the American vernacular. And obviously the, the word mafia would stick with the Italian-American community. But these people were being tried without much evidence, uh, and they were mostly being accused because of their Italian heritage. In 1891, they were found not guilty. But in the South, as often happened to African-Americans, the white southern population would not be denied what they considered justice. Eleven of these accused murderers were lynched by white mobs. These events helped shape public perceptions of Italians throughout the country. It also helped shift Italian immigration from the U.S. South to New York City. So we're going to shift to now why Southern Italians are coming to New York City after the Civil War. In many ways, New York City won the Civil War. The East River, which separates what is Manhattan and Brooklyn, which are actually two separate cities, 
at the time, but also both in the top five in terms of largest cities in the United States. This was the busiest river in the world. In 1867, two years after the Civil War ended, the East River actually froze over and commerce was shut down between the two cities, and so the idea for a Brooklyn Bridge would become realized. A woman, interestingly, ran the project. Right in 1869, construction began. In 1883, it would be completed. And this created a whole new possibility. This was a structure that rose well above the existing skyline. It actually reinvented how to build things out of steel, so it created new possibilities for urban growth. And then in 1898, you have unification of the five boroughs, including Staten Island, Manhattan, Brooklyn, the Bronx, and Queens. So with expanded wealth and growth for the city, uh, what do you need? You need immigrants, right? So a wave of new immigrants would be coming, largely from two places, the Russian Empire and Southern Italy. The vast majority of Italian immigrants who came to the United States would pass through Ellis Island. The vast majority would be Southern Italian, and a large number of those would stay in New York City. Ellis Island opened in 1892 and would service about 12 million immigrants before it was finally closed. These people were getting off ship voyages that would last one to two weeks. Um, these ships were divided by wealth and class, where you had wealthy passengers living in luxury on the upper decks, while the vast majority of passengers were put in steerage at the bottom of the boat with very little space for themselves, no privacy, in, in pretty awful conditions where disease and discomfort was rampant. From an oral history collected by Gutman Community College student Madison Walsh, who interviewed her 104-year-old great-grandmother who remembered the voyage from southern Italy, we learn more about this journey to the United States. The ship was fun for about one hour. Then we cut into the open waters, and the waves were going over the ship. Mm -hmm. It was terrible, but we kids, we ran around anyway, but not the mothers. The adults were throwing up all the, all the way over. On the last day, I think it was the 14th or 15th day, my mother said to me, go to the cabin on the top of the ship. That's where the telegraph office is and send a telegram to your father. Upon their arrival, new immigrants were given a medical exam. They would look for a, a range of diseases, including a contagious eye disease called trachoma. Future New York mayor, Theo LaGuardia, remembers when he served as an interpreter for Italian immigrants. Sometimes, if it was a young child who suffered from trachoma, one of the parents had to return to the native country with the rejected member of the family. When they learned of their fate, they were stunned, and they had no homes to return to. If they passed the medical exam, they were given a legal exam, where they were presented with 29 questions to see if they were a threat and to certify who they were. Some newly arrived immigrants were detained for months, but only about 2% would be deported back to their countries of origin from the island. Four million Italians arrived between 1880 and 1924. About three million went through Ellis Island. The idea for most of them was that they would make some money before returning to southern Italy. About 60% of this community would return home, which was vastly different from other groups that we'll talk about. But again, they're escaping poverty, but they still consider Italy their home. They were going to make some money, bring it back to Italy, and, and improve their lives there. Facing stereotypes and discrimination because unlike their northern Italian compatriots, southern Italians were darker and less accustomed to European ways, southern Italians faced many obstacles after immigrating to the United States. Italians were often seen as violent and dangerous and unskilled workers. While they would send letters home filled with money, they often would not report back the grueling work they were forced to take on to send that money home. Similar to the Irish a few generations earlier, Italians were often given the most dangerous jobs, including work on the subway, which opened in 1904. 
About 7,000 mostly Italian immigrant workers helped build the subway, yet building underground with the limited technology that existed at the time proved a death sentence for many of them. What they constructed, however, did change the world for immigrants to come. The New York subway, which unlike metro systems in other cities and countries, is the same fare no matter where you begin or end, allowed New York City to expand with different neighborhoods taking on different ethnic identities throughout the five boroughs, and everyone having access to all parts of the city. Italians congregated in neighborhoods with people from their same regions of Italy. Little Italy was home to immigrants mostly from Sicily. East Harlem, meanwhile, was home to Italian immigrants from the southern port city of Naples. Facing some of the same discrimination that the Irish did a few generations earlier because of their Catholic faith, Italian immigrants found a Catholic church that was less accepting of their customs as well. Catholicism had developed differently in Ireland than it had in Italy. The Irish had built up the Catholic church in the United States, and those that now ran it raged against Italian immigrants who were also Catholic as not practicing the religion properly or being too emotive with the way they celebrated the Madonna. They called their religious ceremonies an atmosphere of carnival, which was an embarrassment to the church. Because they celebrated the religion so differently, the Italians were often forced to pray and practice their faith in the basement of Catholic churches throughout the city. We also have to remember that these Italians weren't always planning on staying. By and large, they were going to return to Italy with the money that they had earned. As a result of this, they were the least likely white immigrant group to earn their citizenship. They were judged for not learning English fast enough. And when they did send their children to schools, they were often frustrated because these schools were attempting to Americanize them and shed any remnants of their Italian heritage. School teachers would change the names of their students to make them more pronounceable. Protestant missionaries went into Italian communities and told them that their customs were backwards. If an Italian child was orphaned, oftentimes the orphanage would not allow them to speak their native language. This treatment led to resentment, and this resentment led to radical politics that would consume the Italian community in the 1910s, 20s, and 30s. As immigrants often are, they were offered very few employment opportunities. A group of Italians were forced to work in textile mills, where children as young as six or seven would work alongside their mothers just to make ends meet for the family. These sort of conditions led to a big strike in Lawrence, Massachusetts, when a group of textile workers, led by the Italian immigrants, marched off the job when they found that their wages had been cut. Previously, Italians had been brought in as strike breakers, and here they were strike leaders. The police were in the pocket of the mill owners, however, and worked to frame the organizers. Despite this, the strike dragged on. With trouble feeding their families, many of these Italian immigrants were forced to send their children to New York City. The image of these children leaving their families to go in search of food garnered lots of sympathy throughout the country. It led to government hearings, which exposed the starvation wages and child labor that these Italian immigrants were forced to endure. Mill owners across the region were forced to cave and give in to the workers' demands. This sort of organizing exploded in the midst of World War I, which was seen by many as a war that made fortunes for the rich, while costing poor and immigrant communities their sons. As the United States entered World War I in 1917, the government feared that the radical politics and labor unrest of the early 1910s, as well as the immigrant communities with untested loyalties, would undermine the war effort. In 1917 and then in 1918, they passed the infamous Espionage and Sedition Acts, which made it illegal to speak out against the war. Thousands of Americans and immigrants were arrested for exercising what had been their free speech. Government fears were amplified after the Russian Revolution succeeded in 1917, overthrowing the Tsarist system in the effort to create a more egalitarian or equal society in Russia. After the war in the United States, workers who had agreed not to go on strike during the war wanted to be paid for their loyalty. Yet the workers' conditions remained stagnant, and now with millions of soldiers returning home looking for work, employers had little incentive to treat them fairly. Inequity grew substantially substantially during World War I, which infuriated poor and immigrant workers who often served in the conflict that made New York financiers very wealthy. Solidarities were building across working class communities. This terrified the United States government. 
The experience of Southern Italian immigrants in the United States conditioned many of them to want to rid themselves of the oppressive government structures that ruled over them. The Italian government from which they came was ruled by Northerners and had treated them unfairly. And before that, before Italy was unified, Southern Italy was ruled by autocratic leaders who sought to enrich themselves while the majority of the population worked in destitution. When they arrived to the United States, expecting the land of opportunity and equality, they faced violent discrimination and were forced into dangerous and poorly compensated occupations. This experience led to a distrust of the U.S. political and economic elite. In response to their frustration with the way U.S. authorities had treated them, Italian radicals set off to assassinate the United States Attorney General, Palmer, in 1919. While this bombing failed, around 40 bombs went off all over the country, targeting authority figures who attempted to suppress labor, activists, immigrants, and anti-war groups in the preceding years. These events led to a massive crackdown, including the arrest of radical activists Nicola Sacco and Bartolomeo Vanzetti. Neither of them were radical anarchists before they came to the United States. However, having experienced terrible working conditions and feeling the real oppression of the United States government, they turned to radical political solutions. They became scapegoats for the U.S. government who was looking to send a message to radicals everywhere and who put them on trial for a murder they almost certainly did not commit. On September 16, 1920, a horse-drawn carriage stopped at the busiest intersection in New York's financial district, the center of financial power in the United States and the greatest symbol of American capitalism. The carriage was loaded with dynamite. When it exploded, it killed 38 people and injured hundreds. The police found flyers demanding the release of political prisoners, assumed to be Sacco and Benzetti. While no one was ever charged, it was widely assumed that Italian anarchists were responsible. This attack did little to help Sacco and Benzetti, who were on trial for their lives. As the proceedings went forward, it was clear that the trial was more about their activism and the fact that they were Italian than the murder charges. The pair was sentenced to death in 1927. In his final speech, Vanzetti said, I have never stolen, I have never killed. However, my conviction is that I have suffered for things I am guilty of. I am suffering because I am a radical, and indeed I am a radical. I have suffered because I was an Italian, and indeed I am an Italian. After this speech, Sacco and Vanzetti were electrocuted to death. Hundreds of thousands came out for the funeral. However, a lesson permeated the Italian immigrant community, a lesson telling them they don't belong and they will never be seen as equals. These events, no doubt, played a significant role in the passage of the Johnson-Reed Act of 1924. Facing quotas on the 1890 census before the vast majority of Italian and Eastern European immigrants had arrived in the United States, it said that only 2% of the population that existed in the United States in 1890 from each country could come into the United States each year. This helped shut off the flood of immigration to a mere trickle in the years that followed. While well, like all immigrant groups, there was a criminal element to the early Italian immigrants to the United States. It was really prohibition and the continued discrimination against Italian Americans that created the space for the U.S. Mafia to gain influence and power. Young men did not want to live lives of poverty like their fathers had. They had tried to rise and had been rebuffed at every turn. Mob leaders like Frank Costello and Lucky Luciano saw an opportunity when prohibition made alcohol illegal to make money off of the illicit trade. Working with other ethnic groups in New York City, notably Meyer Lansky, who was of Jewish origin, prohibition allowed for the development of the U.S. Mafia in the 1920s and 1930s. For those not engaged in criminal activity, they sought to feel proud of their heritage, and they were offered the opportunity to with the rise of Benito Mussolini, who projected Italian strength through a propaganda campaign in the United States. He was an extremely popular figure in the United States in the 1920s and 1930s, even after he allied with Adolf Hitler. However, when the United States went to war with Italy, Germany, and Japan in 1941 after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, Italian Americans found their loyalty questioned. While not as popularized in historic memory as the Japanese internment camps, Italians too faced severe persecution due to their heritage. Italians without citizenship, which were mostly older Italians, who were intimidated by the process of getting citizenship, were declared enemy aliens and had to carry around ID cards. Italians on the West Coast were forced to move from their homes. 1,200 Italian Americans were detained, and 400 were put in internment camps. 
heroes like Joe DiMaggio's own parents were declared enemy aliens due to the fact that they had immigrated from Italy and never gotten citizenship. Yet unlike Japanese Americans, Italians were quickly given the opportunity to prove their loyalty. While race certainly played a role, perhaps this is because they had the levers of political power. Mayor LaGuardia, who was the mayor of New York City during this period, with his mixed background of Italian and Jewish, he represented what it meant to be from an immigrant family in New York City. The extremely popular mayor became a symbol for Italian Americans across the country and helped them gain acceptance into the mainstream. Congrats, you finished another one. Now you get to watch Rosie eat. Enjoy. <laughs> this is hysterical. 